Hello and welcome to State of the Economy. Uh, today we have as our guest uh, Dr. Narendra Jadav, uh, who is a nominated member of Rajya Sabha and a former member of Planning Commission. And even more than that, uh, he is an economist and we are talking to him today as an economist. Uh, he has been uh, uh, the chief economist of RBI, he worked at the RBI for 31 years uh, and, uh, uh, and he is also an educationist uh, in the planning commission. Uh, he, his role was uh, that of uh, uh, aiding uh, in the formation of education policy. Uh, but today we have uh, called him to discuss the effects of demonetization uh, on the economy. Uh, he has years of experience of researching. Uh, various aspects of the economy at the RBI and uh, RBI is at the very center of this, uh, the demonetization, in fact the decision was recommended by the RBI board. So therefore we thought the right man to talk to us. Uh, welcome to our show Dr. Narendra Jadav. Good evening. So, so please tell us, uh, it is now over a month uh, since the decision to demonetize and uh, we have had uh, various views mm -hmm. coming from uh, policy makers coming from people who are debating this issue, economists, coming from politicians, coming from people on the ground, people who are standing in the queues. There has been a lot of pain which the government has admitted, but the government uh, also says that there will be long term gain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, could you just tell us how do you see uh, the economic effects of uh, demonetization panning out, especially keeping in view its impact on the unorganized sector, the construction workers, the farmers, the poor. Uh, thank you. Uh, Venuji, first thing that I want to say is that, uh, you know, the hardships that people are facing in the queues uh, before the banks, they are, you know, my sympathy is with them uh, and that cannot be uh, denied. However, it's my perception. You can't call them minor inconvenience. No, 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 no. It's a major inconvenience. But again, there, there are problems about it. But let's not go into that. Yeah. One has to accept what has happened. However, what I want to emphasize is that in media and elsewhere, I see people exaggerating the pain that is caused and systematically underplaying the possible gains which are going to be there in the long run. Uh, and by long run, we don't mean a very long time. We are talking about in the near future. After a year or so. Dr. Manmohan Singh, my mentor and guru, said that uh, he quoted Keynes and said in the Rajya Sabha that in the long run, we are all dead. We all know that. But I believe that the effect of this, positive effect of this, is going to be a lot earlier and it is going to be very substantial as things uh, unfold in future. I would expect the inconveniences that people are facing would be over by end of December and by 1st April 2017, which is about four and a half to five months away, you will be able to see a positive impact of this. Okay. Tell me, uh, uh, Mr. Jadav, you have been at the RBI for so many years. You understand yeah. uh, RBI. Uh, now, in the recent monetary policy statement, uh, the RBI mm -hmm. governor mm -hmm. did not give a time frame for the full replacement of the currency which has been withdrawn. Right. Uh, by what, by when do you think, uh, given RBI's printing capacity, etc., mm -hmm. things would be like really normal where mm -hmm. people could, without any restrictions, go and withdraw mm -hmm. their money from the banks. Mm -hmm. What's your sense? You, you must be sort of talking to various people, policy mm -hmm. makers here. Yeah. Uh, my sense is that all the inconveniences would be over in the next few days, if not weeks, by end of December. But normalcy will take little more time uh, because of this. Normalcy system. in the sense of unrestricted withdrawal of Right, money. right. That will take uh, some time, maybe two more months. Or three but months. By, uh, by three months. But in any case, by 1st of April, I think things will, Indian economy will bounce back to its high growth trajectory. What would be the impact? First of all, please note that demonetization is of course a very bold move, a very historic move, but it should not be seen only in isolation. There are five different things which are being done which will change the working of the Indian economy forever. Now what are those five things? First is of course demonetization. 
Second one is what they are doing about uh, uh, you know the income tax amendment that they have, which is nothing but a voluntary disclosure of cash. Third one is the restrictions on gold for future. Fourth one is a huge encouragement to the uh, huge encouragement to digital mode of payment. And fifth one is uh, GST. These five things are all interrelated, and together all these five things are going to make Indian economy cleaner, healthier, while being going back on the high growth trajectory that Indian economy was until recently. But tell, tell me about how do you see the implementation so far, the, no, the estimates they made and, and the entire money coming back into the system. I am not a spokesperson for the government, so I am not going to no, justify. No, I am asking you as an expert, right. I'm, I'm, purely I'm, as an economist okay. Okay. who, who has worked in the RBI, RBI. Chief, right. chief economist of RBI. Right, right. First of all, if you were RBI governor today, okay. how would you have seen it? Okay, okay. Uh, two things I want to I want to say here. First of all, for a country of a continental size uh, and all kinds of complications, territorial complications, uh, complete preparation could was not possible at all. It was not possible at all. Uh, you know, so a lot of people say that enough time was not given for preparation. Let me add something here. You know, uh, when they had taken the decision, uh, please note that on one hand, they had to keep the printing press running uh, in overdrive. At the same time, they had to also maintain secrecy. So there were these two conflicting uh, things. Objectives. Yeah. And, and they had to strike a balance between the two. There was a trade-off. Mm -hmm. Ideally, everything should be done, well prepared, and then the decision would have been announced. But there was a risk of uh, a leakage. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometime, the Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi had to take a call and say, this much, and we are rolling. That must have been the consideration. And those details are also coming out. Yeah. That is one. Second, you know, there is this common perception which is reflected in uh, your question also that the fact that almost all of the money is coming back is seen as a failure of the scheme. Absolutely wrong. This in itself is an achievement. Let me explain how. No, no, yeah, you're right. Yeah. At least the money is back in the system. Correct. But no, a lot no, of it no, got laundered back, right? No, no, no. But uh, you see, first of all, no, one, let, let's understand this. Let's understand this. In India, if you look at India's history of financial development, mm -hmm. there have been three occasions when there was a quantum jump in terms of financial inclusion. Mm -hmm. First was Indira Gandhi's nationalization of right. banks, you know, which converted mass banking, class banking into mass right. banking. Yeah. That was a big one. After that, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Jandhan Yojana was the second big jump towards uh, financial inclusion. This one becomes the third big jump, a quantum leap into financial inclusion. The fact that the money has come back mm -hmm. is not bad because it has not become white. It is good in itself mm -hmm. that the money is back in the system. Mm -hmm. Money which was lying around, money which was hidden. So you uh, say you can't treat it as white. Now there will be investigation to find correct, out correct. the black component. Correct. And so much money coming into the banking system is going to be very beneficial for future. How? Let's look at it this way. On one hand, higher the incidence of black money, higher is the inflationary pressure. And this is, the, this is the common sense. When there is a lot of money sloshing around as a black money, people splurge money. So statistically... So, so it will be disinflationary? No, that is one side. Second side is that banks are now flooded with very large amount of cash. What is the combined effect of these two? Inflationary pressure is coming down and the cash which has come into the bank and the banks being flushed with a very large amount of cash at a very low cost of borrowing. On an average, the cost of raising funds for bank is about 3%. So you think but banks would gain from this? No, not only banks, we are talking about the economy, boss. Economy, okay. These two things together, inflationary pressures being abated and banks being flushed with funds together paves the way for a major interest rate cut in the system which will benefit the economy immensely. So you think RBI should have cut interest rates? In the last I think so, but there is a reason why RBI has not done that. What the is the reason? Huh? I will tell you. Uh, there are two reasons. Uh, one is the global environment. Global, see December 14th 
is the Federal Reserve's announcement of uh, uh, their own monetary policy. And it is widely perceived that they will jack up the interest rates. That would create an outflow uh, from India. That is the perception. That is one. Second, oil prices are picking up. So there is some pressure on inflation. Remember that from well, next year... Because RBI said it also expects food inflation to harden. It is, it, it is happening. What is happening is that core inflation is remaining sticky. Remember that we are, our target is 5%. RBI's target for next year is 5% by January 2017. And we are finding it difficult to drag it below that because already, you know, our ultimate target is 4% to 4% uh, uh, retail two, inflation yeah. plus minus 2%. Now what will happen is this. Uh, why have they not done it? One is the international uh, global development. Maybe they want to wait three months. No, there is a very important second thing. Uh, RBI has always been cautious, but the present cycle of lowering interest rates started in January 2015. What is the, so policy rates when they are lowered, how much lowering of the policy rates that RBI has done from January 2015 to December 2016? 175 basis points. So they've now, done a lot, waiting for wait, transmission to happen. Exactly. Out of this, it's very interesting. Out of this 175 basis point reduction in policy rates, most of it, 170 basis point reduction has already been passed on to the deposit rates. Okay. How much is it passed on by the banking system to lending rates? Only about 85 basis point. So then and there itself, there is a scope for reduction by about full percentage point. So what RBI, as I understand, what RBI, you said if I were governor, if I were governor, I would have seen that policy rates have been lowered a lot, but the transmission effect has not taken place. So I would focus for now on transmission, transmission mechanism and the interest rate. So this rate demonetization lowering. will help uh, better transmission? Of course, when the banks are flushed with funds, banks have no excuse today not to lower the interest rates. And once that process is on, later on, I would expect Reserve Bank to also further lower the deposit, uh, lower the policy Lending rates. rates. Yeah. Okay. And now, this is going to this is going to create a huge gain. For example, take the case of you were talking about small people, housing loans, you know, informal sector, housing loan. If one percentage point reduction means 15% addition to the purchasing power. The EMI comes down by 15 percentage points, which means that uh, there is a 15% more, uh, yeah. more uh, uh, what about, no, purchasing I, I, power I, I, added. I, theoretically, I agree with you, but uh, how, no, how, how do you see We the, are not talking about theory. We are talking about the realities. Yeah. And this is going to happen in the near future. What about the demand shock in the next six months? There are reports in the newspapers right. that a large number of unorganized sector Absolutely. workers, Absolutely. daily wages have been laid off and right. they run into a few million uh, workers. You know, they've all gone back to villages, mass migrations. Yeah. Now, yes. uh, do, you, do you expect a V-shaped recovery uh, post-demonetization or do you expect a kind of saucer-shaped recovery? I am expecting a V-shaped recovery, but for V-shaped recovery, we are talking about crashing and then coming up very fast. Very right? fast, yeah. Now, if that is so... Is, is that going to happen? I am absolutely convinced that that is going to happen. You know, it is true that there has been laying off. It is true, not only can inconvenience in the informal sector, where cash, in all cash intensive sectors, yeah. there is a big damage done. But this damage is transitory. And as the interest rates go down, which I think is inevitable and inex invariably that is going to happen in the near future, not in the long run, I think the economy will get a huge boost and not only that, please note that even before demonetization, our manufacturing sector has been stuck. It has not been growing for our capital goods sector. The investment sentiment has not been very strong. In fact, the em employment had actually uh, Correct. had uh, negative growth of 65%. Look at it this way. In every year, every year we add 12.8 million people to our labor force. How many of them get jobs? So even before demonetization, the economy was, was yeah. slowing down. Yeah. And so that's why some argue that the timing was wrong. No, In timing, a slowing economy, you shouldn't have done this or something. No, no, no. no. At the same time, please also understand, at the macro level, India is today the fastest growing country in the yeah, world. Relative to, yeah. Re mm. Relative to all others. Mm. 
So therefore, I think timing is very was very propitious uh, for having taken this historic action. Tell me, I, I want to come now to gold. Now, yeah, sure. what, what the what the government has attacked mm -hmm. is mm. the the cash component of the black money stock, which right. is roughly right. six percent of the total black money wealth. Mm. Uh, now, gold is a big component. Uh, yeah. Some say it is 40-45% of GDP. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. You worked at the RBI, uh, so you would you would have access to uh, sure. gold research. Mm -hmm. So tell us, how do you now attack gold? Yeah, and then real estate. So these very, two, these two. Components. Very very valid question. Uh, first gold and then real estate. As far as gold is concerned, you know this was not only a surgical strike on cash held with people. It was also surgical strike on gold. In, in some way because of those five uh, different uh, things. Let me give you some number. You know, every year India today imports about 1,000. Because gold is an emotional thing. How do you attack yeah. household gold? Yeah. I, I will come to that. But let's, let's get the broader picture yeah. first. Yeah, yeah. It's very important. This is a very important question that you are asking. You know, every year we import about 1,000 tons of gold. By, by information that RBI and others have, one third of gold is purchased by using cash. So there is a cash and gold nexus. But this is ongoing and we are going to stop that. Second thing, how much gold do we have in the system? You know, nowhere in the world we have so much passion for gold uh, that, uh, that is there in India. No other country. We have with the RBI something like 575 tons of gold. But in the private hands, we have 25,000 tons of gold. In the temples that in India, in temples in India, there is incalculable amount of gold conservatively placed at about 10,000 tons. So, which means that we have about 35,000 tons of gold and much of it is a dead asset. Our wealth, productive wealth is kind of stuck in this nearly dead assets. So, you're saying Tirupati should at least put all the gold in the banks? No, let's look at the value of that. The, at the current market prices, the value of gold that we have is conservatively can be estimated at 850 billion US dollars or 58 lakh crore rupees. That's about 45% and of GDP. Yes, 40 to 45% of GDP today, which means that we have to get this gold stocks work for the economy, work for the people. You are very right in so saying that. Is there a that plan? I think the plan will come up. A plan will come up and it must. We have to work on that because, you know, we have to find a plan. We did introduce, you know, the government did introduce gold bonds, uh, it, but that has not worked so far because a lot of people have this feeling about emotional attachment. You know, women in India, typical, typically, there are exceptions, they buy gold telling themselves that this is an investment they are making. They are saying that this is an investment they are making. But when times come, when there is an emergency, you know, they don't liquidate that gold. Yeah. It remains. It remains. Because there are emotions attached to that. I think we have to find a financial engineering initiative which will, without hurting the emotions and feelings of people, if we can get this gold to work for the economy, it would be giving a new direction to so, the economy. So that, that is the need, uh, the, the second big need. And Absolutely. coming to real estate, right. a lot of economists say, that the, this demonetization has created a big shock in the real estate sector, hmm. which is also linked to construction. Right. And they, there is what economists uh, call an, a negative wealth effect, which mm -hmm. has happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit like, you know, people who hold land, especially mm. in the rural urban uh, intersection, mm. and who every five years sell their land to, you know, for mm. consumption, mm. Mm. they feel that their fixed deposit has collapsed mm. by about 20-30%. Yeah. 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 Now, what are the negative effects of that? There is a general belief that the cash component in the real estate, you know, people presume that all builders are like that and they have large amount of cash, cash component. And that is why the negative wealth effect. My information is that it's only in two states there is a serious cash problem. One is Delhi and interestingly, the second one is Gujarat. So what is going to happen is that 
you know, bigger builders do not anymore in Pune and Mumbai, bigger builders do not go for cash, uh, large, large cash action. element. But small mom and pop shop kind of uh, people. Uh, small construction companies in smaller no, towns. Not even, you know, small, really small guys who have a piece of land and they convert. We, in Maharashtra, we call them Gunta Mantri. Those who have become new or rich by yeah. selling their land. They're called Gunta Mantris. Uh, Gunta is a major of land. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, those people are going to be affected. But real estate sector has already been in turmoil, is in, yeah. in serious... It's not serious recovered since uh, correct, 2008. Correct. Now, just look at it this way. If you find something, you were talking about gold. Now, find something. If people are given an option as an alternative, real estate as a sector, you know, it will make a lot of difference to gold. The gold coming in and being converted into real estate, some kind of financial engineering. Okay. But more importantly, I believe, I believe that although we are highest, you know, fastest growing country in the world and all that, please note that this high growth trajectory has not been accompanied by creation of large number of jobs. Yes. Now, just imagine this demonetization exercise is going to create a give a big boost to India's uh, our uh, our uh, uh, resources in the sense that. Uh, the revenues of the government are going to increase. Somebody has estimated 2.5 lakh crore would be the additional. I don't know. But there would be a huge increase in the government revenues. I would imagine that if this enhancement, this big push, big push in the government revenues, if it is linked up with ho affordable homes for everybody, Another uh, very interesting slogan. So, so then that the, has real, been given. the real estate sector could revive also. Absolutely. Not only the real estate sector will revive. Remember, real estate sector is the one which is the second Provide largest the employer jobs. in okay. in our country. So you're saying the construction sector can be revived, yeah. Absolutely. And that will that would mean that not only we go to the high growth trajectory, we go to higher growth trajectory with lot more jobs created along, which would make our recovery also healthier than Can I ask you one, uh, since sure. we have just about two minutes left. You know, this whole uh, talk of digital economy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, some feel that it is uh, inherently biased in favor of the uh, of the urban middle class, of the top maybe 15% of income, mm -hmm. income earners. Mm -hmm. Since 85% of Indians uh, s still earn their wages in cash and many of them are daily wages. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see this demonetization playing out uh, uh, moving to a uh, India moving to a digital uh, economy mm -hmm. very rapidly and not giving mm -hmm. people enough time to adjust infrastructure okay. uh, you know number of ATMs to population ratio in rural India mm -hmm. so uh, so how will it affect the poor yeah, yeah. Uh, one and the Mm -hmm. Along with this, another question because we have very little time. <laughs> you are a you are a well-known scholar uh, of Ambedkar. You studied Ambedkar mm -hmm. uh, inside out. You've written a books. You have many books, books on yeah. And books. Ambedkar economics, economic right. thought and philosophy. Right, right. Uh, how would Ambedkar uh, have seen this demonetization? Because there's some uh, talk in social media that media that he had supported it. But, but I think you. You, you have rejected that uh, absolutely, thesis. Uh, absolutely. If you can just and you want me to answer these two big questions in two minutes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, if possible. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, I'll be very uh, fast and rapid fire. First of all, let me take the second question first. Uh, the question about Dr. Ambedkar. There was a message going around that Dr. Ambedkar, in his uh, famous book, which was his Doctor of Science dissertation, mm -hmm. uh, titled uh, Problem of Repeats, Origin and Solution, mm -hmm. had said that uh, this is what the message uh, becoming viral uh, that um, Dr. Ambedkar, Baba Sahib Ambedkar said that if you want to reduce corruption, you have to keep changing the notes for every 10 years. Absolutely false. This, you never that said is that. a great book. You know, it's like a Taj Mahal. But a lot of people have tried to put their own eat yeah, to yeah. the Taj Mahal that was constructed. Corruption was not an issue in 1925 when you wrote that book. But he does talk about uh, uh, notes, what he does, you know, that book requires a separate discussion. But he comes close to saying that if you want to make the transaction, more and more people move from barter economy to currency economy, mm -hmm. cash economy that we have today, you have to have the denomination of coins should be lower. Okay. 
20 rupees to 10 rupees took 22 years. That's 10 common rupees sense, to yeah. 5. Exactly. Mm, yeah. He said most of the transactions are in ane pay. So why don't you have lower level of currency denomination? That is what he said. Uh, and the book is about a different subject. There is nothing, no reference. Anyway, we'll have a separate discussion. Uh, that. We will have. Now coming to yes, uh, digital payments. Yeah. 10 years back. Is it loaded against the poor? Currently, yes. But the situation is changing faster than you can imagine. So there's an implementation thing there also. Yeah. There is. There is. Uh, there is an inherent bias involved. But 10 years back, could we have imagined that even the maid servants uh, will have a mobile phone? Yeah. We are very adaptable and we do change. In any case, government has come up with a scheme. I would imagine in future, in the near future, there would be a, we have already made a beginning that service tax uh, on digital payments uh, would be waived and there are a slew of measures which are, they are all steps in the right direction. They will get strengthened as we go along. I would imagine that there should also be a carrot and stick kind of approach. There should be some kind of restrictions or disincentive to cash drawals and incentives for digital payments. That can be introduced over a period of time. And believe me, people will adopt to it much faster than you can imagine. But there would be inherent biases in a complex country like India. So, so, ne yeah. so, so net net, uh, uh, what you're saying is that we need on the other components of uh, handling uh, uh, black money, mm. which is mm. di digital uh, 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 policy, mm -hmm. GST, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one hopes that the implementation is smooth because we implementation has been a key problem. Thank no, you. They, 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 yeah. There is a key problem here that in this transitional process, bank officials and the income tax authorities are getting little too much power. Yeah, and of the course. The of that is also uh, that's, becoming That's visible. part of the implementation problem. Also. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for you. talking Thank to us, uh, uh, Dr. Narendra. Thank Yadav. you. Thank you. Uh, that's all we have in this edition of State of the Economy. We'll be back with you next week. Thanks for watching.